Hello everyone and welcome to today's exam catch up webinar. Um, my name is Jenny Mutley Collins and I'll be moderating today's session along with my colleagues Becky East and Ellie Benstead. During this webinar you'll be able to see and hear our presenter for today Greg <coughs> Archer and also to see his slides. You won't need a microphone. If you want to chat to each other or interact with Greg during the webinar, please use the chat um, and make sure that um, you click the option on the chat that um, allows all attendees to see what you say, if you want them to, of course. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions for Greg about any of the content we've shared, um, please write these in the Q&A tab. So we'll be using the Q&A tab rather than the chat for the questions at the end. Um, you should be able to find this in your control panel and we'll answer as many of these um, as we can after the presentation. The recording of today's webinar will be on our exams catch up site by next week. We'll email you a copy of your attendance certificate next week. So um, without too much further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Greg as this afternoon's presenter. Greg Archer is an experienced Delta qualified teacher and teacher trainer. After moving to Cambridge in 2013, he spent seven years working at an international college there various times managing the English language department, developing appropriate courses to run alongside A-level and GCSE study and teaching C1 Advanced, B2 First, IELTS and English for academic purposes classes. This is to students with the ambition of entering a UK or English speaking university. He's been an IELTS examiner in writing and speaking and now also produces exam text as an item writer for Cambridge Assessment. So lots of great experience there, some of which we're going to get in today's webinar. So we're looking forward to hearing Greg talk to us today about tips for C1 Advanced. Um, so I'm very happy to hand over to Greg at this point. Over to you. Hello. Thank you, Jenny. Um, good. I don't know. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Whatever it is, there's, there's quite a, a wide range of timescales um, for us all here today. Thanks for giving up your time to come and um listen to, to what we've got to say here um this is a kind of exams catch-up webinar um it's it's as you probably know that all the Cambridge exams are coming back online now and, and they're going live again so um we're we're, we're going to be thinking about kind of rebooting um your your teaching practices um for for that rebooting your your awareness of, of the exam and I, I know that there are some of you who kind of have walked a little bit back from teaching uh, advanced classes for a while um, because of the exams stopping. Uh, maybe you still continued. Maybe uh, I know that there are also one or two, uh, well, a few people who have, uh, are about to start the teaching for um, for the advanced exam. So, um, what what the, the aim is here today really is to kind of um, look at some tips um, to to look at some tips for uh, the, the C one exam, uh, C one advanced exam. Um, and I'm, I'm just really, there's an aspect here of kind of reviewing what you might already know, but also I just want to talk about things that I, I have found effective um, in, in the classroom. Um, as Jenny said, I, I worked at um, an international school here in Cambridge for, for quite a long time. Um, and I, I stopped that just, just before the, uh, the, the, the pandemic broke out. And obviously we've all had quite a lot of time to kind of reflect on um, teaching practice um, over the past year. Um, but I'm focusing on, on kind of thinking about how to how to develop a lesson. Um, and the way that I've, I've tended to do this in the past is really to, to, to think about what, if I ask myself, well, what we're doing here in, in, the, in the lesson, let's look at this part of the exam. What is it actually testing? What skills, what language is it actually testing? And how can I use that awareness to help me kind of build out um, from that um, and also it, when, when I have my course book um, in front of me that we're using or, or, or past papers what can I do to build on what is given to me on the page because if, if you know as as people have taught exam classes before know the worst thing we can do is just give them 
pass paper after pass paper constantly. Um, so it's about making making things a little, you know, kind of engaging um, and effective. Um, and, and to do this, um, we, we haven't got a huge amount of time, so I'm going to focus purely on, on three aspects of, of the reading and use of English um, papers here. Um, if, if, you, if you are new to the advanced uh, exam and you're not sure what multiple choice, close, open, close, don't worry, because obviously we're going to have a look at that now. But these are the three parts of the, of the exam that I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, and the second two, part two and part seven, are... In my experience, I've found they are often um, the, 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 the type of things that kind of, that the parts of the exam that, that students often say to me, oh, I, I, I can't get it. I, I have no idea what, what I'm doing here. Um, so what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going, to sh I'm going to show you something that I've used regularly in class, and I do find it as an effective um, approach to, to, to working with this exam. So I say to the students, OK, um, I'm going to give you some words and I'm essentially what I'm doing is I'm giving them a lexical set. But I want them to discuss that lexical set and I want them to think about um, any similarities. I want, but it's essentially a compare and contrast exercise uh, of meaning and use. And I will give them um, the, the, the words. Now, obviously, at, at C1 level, they should have the linguistic capability to be able to discuss and compare and contrast these things in, in an abstract way. They have the language there. Or should have anyway. Um, but what I always find interesting is, is I give them these these words, and it's not easy. It's not easy if somebody says, "Right, what? Tell me how how are common common and every because these they're all kind of similar in in what they mean. They're not a million miles away from each other. But how do you actually put that into words? Well, tell me what's the what's the similarity or the difference with common and every day? And it's it's quite difficult to do. Um, and then you start working towards, well, let's get a def they start thinking about definitions and examples and antonyms and synonyms. And it builds this awareness of kind of words do not exist on their own, um, other than as a, as a kind of a signifier and, and a, def a, def a, a, a disembodied definition. So what I do next is I say, OK, well, we've, we've thought about we've thought about these words here. Um, let's actually think about them in 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 a context um and i asked them which sentence is correct and why okay now i'm about to put four um i'm going to put four sentences onto the screen here um and just i'm going to hand over to you in the chat box um could you just uh tell me uh, right into the chat box which of the following sentences is correct and why okay i'll give you 10 15 seconds to um read through the the sentences and just tell me of one two three or four which sentence is uh, correct and why? Okay. Okay. Most uh, most most people are coming coming up. Yeah, with the with the uh, correct answer. Yep, yeah, there was there was someone who just who, uh, who was who was that? Oh, I, I, I missed it. Um, it is it is number three in the conventional way, and I, I caught I caught somebody say somebody give the answer as um, as 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 it flew past on my chat box. Um, it's a collocation. It's it's actually it's a fixed phrase. That is the most that is the the, the kind of the C one um, way of saying it. it. It's a story that begins in the conventional way. Now, if you say it begins in the common way, the everyday way, the straight way, I kind of under I understand what you mean. But this is a nice way of kind of showing the students, yeah, I, if you use this language, I know what you mean. But that at C1, they, 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 they should be able to demonstrate that kind of awareness, that, that defined ear of the nuances and, and the, the, the parts of language where you, you're kind of pushing up to that score. If you're aiming at score 200 and above, then in the conventional ways, what the examiner will kind of be listening out for. Um, and what I've done here is essentially taken, um, I've, I've taken something out of the, the reading and use of English part one um, text. Now, this is a question that if, you, if you're not completely familiar with the exam, what happens is that the, the, the candidates will get a, a full text of around about 160 words, 170 words. And they have um, an example and eight gaps 
eight gaps that they have to f f fill in, and as said, they will get four options given to them of which which um, which is the correct answer. Um, and as you see, I've, I've I've taken if you read this first sentence, I've basically gone to the exam paper, a past paper, and worked back from it. Um, so this paper about studying black bears after you're studying North America's black bears in the and this uh, you see at the top of the, the screen is what is given as an example. Um, obviously, you don't have to work with just the example that's given in a text. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to do is kind of suggest that don't don't see an exam text as just there it is. Think about how you can work back from it and put it in another context because it is about this the C1 higher level language, if we can get that lexical priming going and, and, and see how it fits in different contexts, then um, that, that's wonderful. That's, that's what we're aiming for them to do. Um, a, another quick question for the, um, uh, uh, number one, let's, let's, ask you, uh, let's ask you to put in the chat box, can you tell me what the answer is for, for, for question one? Can, obviously in the exam, you get the options, but, does anybody um, uh, know what the the answer is? Okay, we've got, uh, this is really interesting what I'm seeing on the chat box. Um, these are the options that you get. These are the options that you would get in the, um, in the exam. Um, and obviously the correct answer is, is B, win. He had to win their trust. Quite a few people I've noticed in the chat box there have, have used uh, gain. And in actual fact, uh, gain and win their trust. They're both collocations, but gain, um, if you look at a corporate search, it's a less common collocation than win their trust. So it's it's one of those things that, that as an examiner, you kind of, you have an ear for the, or for or you, you see it on a page, you say, okay, gain their trust is, is perhaps less common than win. And it helps towards that kind of, that, that showing the, the high level vocabulary. But the point I want to make here is that you, you know, you get this in the class and very often we kind of use an exam text and just go, right, there you go. Well done. That's the correct answer. B, win. Always, 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 always ask them, is there another, another way to say this? Can we, can we, can we do, can we do something other than win? And yeah, of course we can. We can say gay. Uh, I noticed a couple of people said earn their trust. And so, um, what we've got to a point here is we've, we've, we've got the exam text here. We've, we've come back from it and then we've worked up to it. Um, and let's, let's uh, part of the reason why I do it in this way is it kind of, this clearly looks like an exam paper. It's got that test validity and it looks a bit, it's a little bit scary in a way. But all we're doing here is kind of repackaging that fixed phrase, that vocabulary in something that isn't quite as intimidating. And, it's showing students, yeah, it's it's a phrase that can exist in many different different ways. So what? Let's let's think about this here, this question, which is correct and why. Let's change the question. So we've done the first bit. We've done we've looked at the exam, and and at this point, this is this is a nice question. We've got this this fixed phrase in the conventional way. Where else might it be useful to know it? Where else is this? Um, where, is, where, where could you put this phrase elsewhere? Um, and if we read this sentence here, it strikes me that this is, this is kind of set up for a writing part too. This, and, and this is about their, their use because we, we, we're confirming that the meaning and, and the kind of the collocation and then, we, and then think, well, how do you use it? How, could, how would you use it? Because it's a big part, I think, of advanced level teaching, C1 level teaching, they, the students often have a huge passive vocabulary and it's getting that passive re recognition towards actual use and active uh, use of language. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great thing to have for a review. Um, additionally, well, of course it, it could be used for, for a speaking test. Now, what I think is important, um, and this is also, this is, Definitely from my experience most recently of, of teaching students, sort of high school age students, that they, they do need a little bit of help to get to where you want them to get to a lot of the time. They're not, they're not quite mature enough in their, in their um, thinking or cognitive skills to do it necessarily on their own. So I make sure I, I say, OK, we've got this phrase. It, it is useful in the speaking test. And here are two questions. The first one is a part one uh, from speaking part one. And the second one is speaking part four. If you don't know, speaking part one um, is where the interlocutor, the examiner will ask 
uh, the candidate sort of personal questions. Um, <laughs> well, not 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 personal, not personal questions. Not like, tell me, are you married? Um, but questions about the personal, you know, likes, dislikes, um, that sort of thing. And part four is where it expands to a kind of more abstract. But I give them the questions rather than expecting them to get there themselves, because I, I've, I'm sure we've we've all done this, is that we kind of get to the extension of knowledge stage, extending the vocabulary stage. And um, we'll ask questions like this. Um, in the conventional way and we'll, we'll kind of pause with, and open class can you think of another way to use it? is there another part of the exam where it's good to know this and it's great of course we need to do that i i think that these questions are prompts and they are a starting point rather than a kind of can you think of another part of the speaking as part of the exam where it'd be good to know oh yes it will work in speaking exam yes great move on that's that's not really enough so these are prompts and I think learners do appreciate that when you give them actually specific examples of, of where it, it works in the exam or where it could come up in the exam, this, this language that you, you're focusing on. Um, so you say to them, well, it, it, this, this language that we're doing, it could work here with this question, how? And then get them to, to build around the language rather than, than do all the work. And of course, I'm not, I'm not you know, suggesting that, that you do this just for one fixed phrase. Um, that would be, you know, it's a little bit of a waste of time. But if you've got, if you've looked at your um, reading part one um, passage and you, you've extracted, say, five or six lexical items, that, then that's that's exactly where we get. Well, these could work here, perhaps. And how can we use that for these questions? Um, and the basic stuff. I mean, it, we teaching generally has kind of been a bit stop start, <laughs> stop start over the past year. But it is about recycling and reviewing. We've, we, I've, I've, you know, there's so many times where I kick myself because I've forgotten to do this part of it. And if you if you get to a, a class where maybe you're talking about um, whether the topic is work, then pull this vocabulary back from your previous classes. I've never wanted to do what what language are we looking at here? What's this fixed phrase from before? And the keeper notes of your own Lexis used in class. I know, I know, I know that this is kind of English language teaching rule one. It's, it's, it, but it's, it's not difficult to forget to do this, um, particularly when you are kind of really, you know, I, as, as I said, I, I worked at an international college. I was working three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And in that time, I had 18 hours of, of teaching. So I understand that the time pressures are really <laughs> for a lot of us and actually writing down what you've done in class. You, you forget it sometimes, but it is it's so, so useful. But this is this is what the main point, really. If you if you see the, the paper, the test paper as a source of language, not just something to test, um, then you can open things up a little bit. And this is what actually happens um, in. I'm going to show you something from um, uh, the course book, uh, Open World Advanced. Um, and it takes this idea of um, a, 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 a lexical set and, and works with it in a slightly different way. Um, I'll just leave you to read the, um, the, the, the rubric there at the top. Um, so you, you, we're asking the students to look for, for, for close synonyms um, in the same way, but that's important what it says there. Again, reiterating what I was saying, you know, trying to get across before. Some of the words have different meanings in different contexts, but we can extend that and say some of them, some of them are just not collocation. Um, so we can see from number one here, recruit, hire, appoint, make redundant. That's taking this idea of, of, a, of a four, of a foursome, of a, of a uh, lexical set of four. Make redundant is obviously the, the, the outlier but dismiss sack let somebody go fire and again these are all kind of sets that you can get the students to discuss well what do they do they mean and in in the book um it, it's it gives it gives open closes to to fill in today i was interviewed for the something of sales manager but i didn't get it um and we've we've, we've seen these these types of exercises before but it, it builds on this idea of we there are words that are close in meaning but Number one, I was interviewed for that. Look at number eight. Look down to number eight. I was interviewed for the role of sales manager. Yeah, position of sales manager, post of sales manager, but I didn't, didn't get it. Um, 
Uh, here's another one here that's been, he's so ambitious. He wants to climb the something ladder. Um, and if you look at number nine, um, the answer there is, is uh, he wants to climb the, it's not a vocation ladder, it's a, it's a career ladder. Um, and what I was saying just a moment ago about building on what, you've, what you're working with them, um, is there another collocation that we can think of to, to climb the something ladder all the way to the top and become CEO? Can anybody think of another collocation of the something ladder rather than career ladder? Um, if, you, if you have got an idea, then um, put it into the chat box. Um, professional ladder, maybe... Cor yeah, Erica, corporate. The corporate ladder is, is, an, is another collocation. You climb the corporate ladder. Alan, you have it as well. And that is, again, less a less common collocation than, than the career ladder. So th th the point here is that I'm, I'm kind of, I'm always thinking of, of adding things to what we're, what we're doing in class and giving them a little bit extra. Um, and what I might do with this, because this is, this is that you had 12 questions in the, on this page of, of the book. Um, and what I might do with it here is, is to actually divide um, these 12 lex lexical sets into groups of three um, and give them to right, one group of students. So you could have four groups of students or four pairs or, or however you want to do it, or it could be homework to do. But the, the students kind of make their own sentences. And I would say I would probably do this after we've worked with we've had a look at the vocabulary first so that we, we clarify that the nuances of, of the meanings and then they go away and, and they write sentences to actually start using it and this is the main thing isn't it because we kind of we, we we're very good at explaining and showing language um are we are we giving them enough opportunity to use it and practice it um so really this is the starting point for for using an exam and an exam class is developing your language skills isn't it testing is the end goal um and as long as we're kind of aware of, of context and, and things like collocation, <clears throat> it will it will help them tremendously to um, to to work work forward with that. And it also means that you're doing more than just putting exam papers in front of them. And it kind of it there's a challenge for you as a teacher. This kind of opening up um, that happens. I'm going to move on quickly because uh, I don't want to run completely out of time. We're going to look at the um, we're going to look at reading and use of English part two, the open close. Um, and if, if you're not, if you've not seen this before, it's a similar thing to the part one. And then students get a, a text. It's a similar length to part one um, with gaps and they have to complete the gaps. Um, but they don't get the options this time. They basically have to look at the text and read um, and, and complete the gaps and know what the words are, the individual words that go in the gaps. Now, um, I, this is what I always used to say to my students, because this is often the advice that you get. Um, make sure, don't, don't just read from start to finish. Don't even try to answer any questions. Read the entire text before you even start to think about what words go in the gaps. And the, 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 the logic is clear because it's kind of, well, then you can read from start to finish and you get the whole context. You know what the, 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 the text is about. And I, 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 <laughs> it got to a point where I, if you've taught this before, you will know exactly what happens because you give this to the students and they get the pen and then they immediately they start filling in the gaps. And it really frustrated me because I was telling them, no, read it first, wrestling, just <laughs> wrestling pens out of hands. Um, I, I'm, I don't think I believe that is, is necessarily the way forward with it anymore. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why here. And, I'll, and, and this is how I came to a, a, an interesting way of teaching, of using this for, for a teaching um, situation. Um, and the fact is that this idea of reading from start to finish before filling in the gaps um, is actually really difficult to do. Um, I'm just going to put this on. See, see if you can do it here, right? Because I can't, I can't. When you read that first sentence, can is it easy to read? Is it easy to read that without filling in the uh the gaps can you read that and just sort of um go the truth and nobody because i find it very 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 difficult <laughs> to do because my brain is is basically already there filling in the gaps for me the truth is my brain is doing the work um so essentially what we're doing when we say to the students well don't try and fill in anything at all read it from start to finish is we're saying to them 
ignore your brain. <laughs> don't do what your brain is, is telling you to do. It, your brain is trying to help, but don't let it help you. <laughs> Which is crazy. Um, it is absolutely crazy because you're going to do that anyway. So there's the, there, there it is. Clearly, the truth is nobody really knows how language first began. Your brain, you kind of your, your brain fills it in. Um, can anybody tell me again? Can we go to the chat box? Did, what is the answer? Oh, excuse me. What is the answer to um, uh, to number nine? Can you tell me the answer to number nine? Did we all start talking around the same time? Mm, of the manner, anybody? Uh, anybody get the answer to number nine? It's a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased you're having problems with it because I did when I first read this. Um, uh, when I, when I, uh, there's, there's some really nice suggestions. Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard question. And do you know what I mean? You know, I, I, when I, when I've got this, I try, I've tried it as well with C2, with proficiency classes and it stumps them as well. And it's one of those ones that is really, really, really simple when you know it and you kick yourself. Um, and, um, uh, okay. Okay. A couple of people have got it now. Um, it's one of those ones that's easy when, when you know how. And I figured it out because it's, what I did was I, I started I started getting really frustrating. And I was, I was reading it and rereading it and rereading it. And like students do, you know, when they, they sit there and they stare at the gap, they stare at this gap hoping that the answer is going to magically fade in and appear. If, oh, thank, thank goodness for that. But I couldn't get it. So what I started doing, um, I, I started saying it. I said, okay, did we, did we all, saying it to myself, did we all start talking around the same time? Uh, manner? Did we all, because manner in which our brains are did we all start talking around the same time? Uh, uh, the man, that thing that I'm doing really helped me. And then I went, did we all start talking around the same time because of the manner in which our brains have begun to develop? And I kind of really, yes, it's a cause and effect. It's a cause and effect type thing. But actually saying it, really helped me to get there and it something something clicked the light went off went on <laughs> then and i thought okay this is this is interesting um because i've suddenly kind of understood that what we what what this task is and again thinking about the task this is the first uh, use of english question in in the whole paper um part one is actually the score you get for part one that we just looked at before that is part of your reading score um, because you read it and you are given the words and then you have to decide which ones fit in. So it's actually a reading exercise. This one is about use of English, use. And so getting stuck in reading, reading, reading again, kind of is a bit counterintuitive. This is, a, this is about use of English. And then I started thinking, well, let's, let's, let's do it so that we're not, we change it from a, a reading exercise. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to show you how, what I do in class now. We're going to uh, this is a text I've taken from Open World Advanced again. Um, it works with any reading use of English part two question. Um, please try it. It's especially you know if if you, if your if your students are getting a bit you know they need a bit of lifting. It's it can be quite fun. It's quite fun to do this. Um, and we're going to we're going to have um, look at a text from from the book that's explaining the urge to climb Everest. Okay. Now this is what I give the students. Um, they get this kind of this kind of answer sheet and the title explaining the earth to climb Everest. And what I'm essentially doing is um, there's a little bit of gamification going on here, a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra fun. Um, now, if they get the, the answer correct in the first column, then they get two points or three points. You can whatever. If you're being generous, you can give them three because it's quite difficult. And if they get it right in the second time in the, the answer two column, they get a point for it. So basically, the first time is more difficult and the second time they get one point and the first time is more difficult because what i actually do is i'll read it to them i know that again it sounds a little bit counterintuitive but they actually listen to this um this text first of all um and i'm going to try it with you now so i'm going to I'm, uh, the chat box again um here's what i'm going to do i'm going to read the first part i want you to try and um tell put in the chat box what is answer number one for question zero okay 
And you're going to know what it should be because what I do, instead of actually saying the word that it is, I intonate it. Okay, so listen to this. What is the answer number one? Explaining the urge to climb Everest. Recent pictures showed mountaineers literally queuing to get to the very summit of Mount Everest. Hmm. At 8,848 meters is the world's highest peak. Hmm. I'll read it again. Recent pictures showed mountaineers literally queuing to get to the very summit of Mount Everest. Hmm. At 8,848 meters is the world's highest peak. Okay. So that's what you do. And, and then you, you, you read through the whole text and they, they have to try and try and answer all of them. And if they get it right on that one, yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult thing uh, to do. And then on the, on the follow up um, to, in order to get the, the answer to once we've done all the um, all the questions and I've read it to them, then I, I do give them um, the text. So this is the text. Um, and yeah. Plenty of people got it right there. Um, recent pictures showed Mountain is literally queuing to get to the very summit of Mount Everest, which, and if you say it as it's supposed to supposed to be said, then it kind of gives them that that extra bit of okay, um, I understand what is what we're doing here now. Um, so I'll just I'll just try it for for another another couple. Let's um, let, let's see if you can do um, let's see if we can actually do one um, one two and three. Um, Okay, so we got to the end there. And with low oxygen levels and frequent avalanches, climbing Everest is certainly not mm -hmm, a degree of risk. And yet, mm -hmm, this, unprecedented numbers of people continue to take it on. So just what is mm, that makes Everest so irresistible for climbers? Okay. With low oxygen levels and frequent avalanches, climbing Everest is certainly not mm -hmm, a degree of risk. And yet, mm -hmm, this unprecedented. So I'm not going to I'm not going to label the point because you kind of get it, and and I can see that um, yeah, you, you, you're getting the answers there. The chat box is, is showing me that you're getting the answers. Um, but what what is this doing? I think it is um, it's it's giving the students a chance to actually hear it. And if you can get them to a point where they are confident in actually, well, no, it sounds right. If I say it, it sounds right. I've had loads and loads and loads of students who are kind of um, pretty good, pretty good level, but they're, they, they're not confident enough to go with their first instinct, to follow that voice in their head, and they overthink things and end up getting the wrong answer. So in class, what I do is, is I, I get them to practice, I get them to read it out loud. And it's quite fun when, when you get you know, a, a busy class of, of students and they're all reading it to themselves and trying to hear it. Um, or reading it to each other. It's really nice because it, it, this is used, this language doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not just a reading passage and that's it. And it's also a lot of fun. I've, I've, I've done it before where, um, uh, I mean, the hmm helps because you've got the intonation, but if you've got a strong class, I've done it before where I have, you know, those ding, the bells, um, and they, they press the, the bing when, for, to, um, where the word should be. And it's it, 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 it's good fun. It's 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 good fun because it is moving from part one of the receptive to that productive um, productive part of the um, the language. Um, and yeah, it's 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 not easy. So perhaps if, if you're easing your class back into to an advanced kind of um, an advanced class and they're not particularly confident in the moment all you need to do is just replace that with a paper the same paper from the first exam um, it's the same principle the same format it's the same part two and you see, you can do the same things with it but the, the challenge level is a little bit less so that's and again you know if you've got differentiation in class if you've got weaker students then maybe give them the the, the first paper it's and the, the stronger ones it's, it's up to you how you manage it i'm not going to kind of get too much into differentiation here because we all know how to how to you know how to approach this in class um but this is this is a this is uh, you know i tell them read it aloud read it to yourself um <laughs> obviously not in the exam don't <laughs> the, in, the invigilators just sitting there and all of a sudden about eight of my students start barking on about um mountaineering so read aloud in your head um, okay, so is this principle really of, of rethinking what what the exam task is and, and, and thinking about what is it actually testing and how can we get to um, get to a point where we know 
what we're doing and we're confident and, and looking at things from different angles and it, it's it's a, it's a nice way of being kind of challenging yourself as a teacher um let's look at this 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 final one here um i'm gonna write i might end up rushing through this a little bit because <clears throat> we, we aren't necessarily well we should be okay if we're not then this will be on a blog um i'm gonna write up a blog after the 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 webinar so um, that will be online shortly and i will make sure that this is this you know that the principles here go on there for you to check after um gap text i love i love teaching gapped text i think it's, it's just a wonderful task to do to teach there's so much in this that is real meat for a language teacher um and uh, it's it, if you don't if you if you're not sure um what it is if you're new to advanced teaching basically um here's what it is and on, on the left side here as you'll see you get you get a text um from start to finish and you get the paragraphs are missing you have to decide which of the paragraphs um to belong in which places um and you get one extra paragraph they the, the there's one extra paragraph which is there to kind of distract you a little bit um but the whole thing of this is kind of what is this testing what is this testing and it's testing so many wonderful things it's testing you know can do, do you understand how um a, a text a piece of writing works how does how do we how does each part fit together how does it one paragraph follow another what's going on there how, why how is this logical from start to finish there's so there's so much interesting stuff here to work with um how do we get from start to finish how, how does the writer do this um and we'll, we'll look at another um example here from from open world um and this is uh the the, the title of the article that's that is being looked at um in this exercise is, is the wisdom of crowds um this is the first paragraph can you can you just um quickly scan that for me i'm not going to i'm not going to dwell on it for too long okay um and this there's a gap there where a paragraph needs to go um and the next paragraph is the one that follows the missing paragraph so it's talking it's in the introductory paragraph there and then we've got a missing paragraph and then um this now now uh, what it does in, in in the book is is it is it's it's really nicely really well written and it, it kind of it gives you the the scaffolding that you that the students need and that you as the teacher can can give them um in a nice way and it's it's kind of so far we don't why is the writer told us about the competition the rate of 543 Okay. which option completes the anecdote and it highlights this anecdote and obviously this is a reference word which which talks which references what has just come before um and then this anecdote and then we, we go on to the next and there's another missing paragraph um but the point here is that the what is in the book here are exactly the right questions um and exactly the right kind of help that um that students need so I'm not going to ask you to scan this again, but this is um, the previous paragraph says groups are intelligent. So look for a paragraph that mentions that. And the next paragraph begins. So so the the, the course book gives a real kind of um, a, a foundation for understanding how to do this. It's really, really nicely written. Um, just just to <laughs> just want to say here, I didn't write this. Um, <laughs> it'd be really, um, yeah, I don't want to come, this is really, really nicely written, this, this section, by me. Um, it's, I didn't write this, but I really, I, I like that, I really love the way it, it kind of, it approaches this, um, this part of the, the test. Now, what my students find difficult is doing that bit in the white box for themselves. So I, I, it's especially as, a, as the age group that I was teaching, the kind of 15 to 19 year olds, can't do, it's, they haven't quite yet developed in many cases that they're developing those, those thinking skills that um, they, they're gonna need at university and in life and going on. <clears throat> and what I, one thing that I found was that if I often give them um, a paragraph and I say, okay, here's a paragraph. I want you to just, let's, let's go through all the questions that this paragraph on its own, without anything before or after. Let's think of how, how many questions can we ask 
about this question that we think could be answered before or after this paragraph. So I, I, I know it's annoying when someone reads when you're reading, but I read it through. For this reason, it does not sink, but remains on or close to the surface where it is frequently mistaken for food by fish, birds, or marine mammals and swallowed. These creatures can then starve as the material they have swallowed is simply indigestible and yet their stomachs are full. So I say to the students, right, what questions come up here? Because what I'm trying to do is get them to answer get get a, comp a compile a list of unanswered questions that they can then look for the answers for before and after so what is it it does not sink well why would something not sink but remain on, on or close to the surface the surface of what doesn't say so what is the surface and i know in a way this is kind of basic stuff but I've found it really helps, particularly with less mature minds that it's kind of, OK, let's really, really think about every question that could possibly be asked here. Why might it be mistaken for food? Why? What does it, what, what does it look like? What's, what's the material made from? And all these, the more questions you can get for a paragraph, the easier it often becomes to then look at other paragraphs. Oh, there it is. There's the answer. There's the connection. And by building build doing this often it builds it you practice it and you build their ability to ask these questions and to, to write these questions for themselves very quickly um and here's an example this is this is one that i gave my students the results demonstrate that pollution at sea while densely cluttered within the patch is still scattered still scattered it does not form a solid mass and i feel the trash island model and these are these are questions that my, my students came up with and i think these are lovely um, I th this was a, a group, I think they were 16, uh, yeah, I think they were 16 years. But this is precisely what I wanted them to do. Okay, number one, which results? We don't know, because still, why did, why did they use, is the right comparing something in the past to present? That was a really nice thing to pick up on. That's, the pollution at sea is still scattered. Hmm. Is there a comparison there? The patch. So the writer thinks we already know what the patch is. What is the trash on? What, what does not form a solid mass? And if you if you get them kind of what 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 does that mean? Why is that there? The more they get into that habit, um, the better. And then I'll feed some more into to it and say, okay, what is the why is the writer's tone here? Are, are they surprised with the results? Um, and if we look at the way that it's written, it does not form a solid mass and does not fit the model. Well, why the repetition? because presumably the writer wants to emphasize it. And this paragraph, is it going to become at the beginning, middle or the end of a section of, of text? And I, I think this kind of clearly shows that it's not going to come at the beginning or nor the middle. And, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you to read this. I, I'll, I'll try and put this on the blog. But it shows you that this that we've just looked at is a kind of a summarizing paragraph of, um, of the previous ones. Um, because what is what this is doing is it is testing their understanding of written discourse. It is under, that under once you've got this, then you can understand so much more. And I, once they do get it, I, I try to get them to realise how it's helping their writing skills. <clears throat> I'm going to show you one more thing that I've done in class that I think is 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 very very helpful. Um, we're going to go back to this one, this anecdote. So there's this paragraph, and then there is a missing paragraph. And then underneath that, there is the following paragraph on that. And what I do um, is I kind of edit, hugely edit the missing paragraph and I give them that. Okay, that's what's, I've taken those words, those phrases from the text, they are in order. Um, can you write that paragraph for me? So again, we're, we're looking at this idea of extension extension from what the actual exam task is and they, they it's brilliant because they often look at that and they go i don't know how am i how am i going to write a paragraph for that but because you, you're giving them the main content points then they can they can usually do it i mean this is this is the the one that's used um and it's it, it actually turns into quite a nice um noticing uh, activity because what they produce and then comparing it to what the uh, the, the original is then you, you've got a lot of language work to do there as well but they often surprise themselves for in what they can do obviously we're, we're nearly out of time so I'm, I'm not going to get you to read this but um, there's a paragraph there's a gap and there's another paragraph and this is what I give them does not sink on or close to the surface mistake of food condensed and they, they basically fill in the gaps around it 
they've got a skeleton of a text and it's uh it's something they have to and then you can compare it to what they've done before uh, from what what's actually the exam task and, and what they would be, be um be reading in this part seven and you can you can highlight some wonderful things you can look you can have point them towards okay for this reason did anybody put a, a cohesive device like for this reason when when you when you all wrote your paragraph look for for this reason these creatures can then starve i gave you can then starve but these creatures why is it and then because you've given them something they've produced something and then you show them what the the original was it, this is this is classic elt stuff within an exam context and there's language work that can be done. Um, but this is why one of the reasons why I love part seven, because it, there is so much that you can do with it. And it's put, it's one of the, it's, it's students, so many students have said to me, I can't get it. I don't understand it. I'll never understand how to do these. And then eventually it clicks and it's, it's brilliant because you, you sort of, you get that moment where you give them, you give them a, a paper to do in class and they do it really quickly and you, you know you walk in you're walking around and you're monitoring and you're having a look at what who's doing what and then they give you this look and they just show you the paper and you go yeah and they look at you and go yes got it and that questioning thing that i was just talking about really really it might seem a long-winded way of doing it the long way around but it really isn't it it, it develops those questioning analytical um critical thinking skills that are not just useful for this, but are useful for, for academic study um, thereafter. Um, I'm going to finish up. Um, but yeah, so honestly, thanks for, for listening. I'm, I'm going to put the uh, Q&A box on in a moment. Um, my contact details are at the bottom there if you want to um, uh, get in touch or if you want to um, uh, contact me. Um, and I'm also doing another webinar on uh, first on Wednesday, the 21st of April, which will which will have ideas that are essentially transferable to, to the, um, the the advanced exam as well. Just handing you over to Jenny. Yes, many thanks for such an interesting session, Greg. Um, that was really good. Loads of lovely tips there. Um, ways of really sort of getting into the the language for C1 Advanced. So um, attendees, um, before you head off, a reminder that we will send you your attendance certificate by email in the next few days. Um, but now we're going to head into a question and answer session. So if you've got any questions for Greg, um, you can start typing those in the Q&A box and Greg will answer as many as possible in a moment. And um, while you're thinking, I'm just going to run you through a little bit of information about some of the materials um, that we have to support you, um, particularly for C1 Advanced. So um, I'm assuming everyone here is interested in preparing students for C1 Advanced. Sorry, it's just gone on too far with that slide. OK, there we go. Um, so what I've got on the screen here um, these are quick and easy ways of training for these exams. Um, the exam booster there on the left provides lots and lots of exam task practice, which you can dip in and out of for um, task and still skill practice. Um, the C1 Advanced Trainer provides six practice tests, the first two of which are fully guided with training tasks and tips. And the advanced three on the right provides four practice tests, which are just like the real exam. So that's for optimum exam familiarization. And then slide two, open world. Um, now, this is the course, as it says on the screen, which takes you further. It's great for combining general English with thorough exams preparation, and it's suitable for school age students and older. Um, real world situational language um, targets life skills and new for this year we have got um, open world C1 advanced which you can see there um, in the middle. And excitingly open world advanced is one of our courses which comes with the brand new Cambridge One digital pack. This gives you all of your teaching and learning resources in one place. Um, practice Extra provides additional grammar and vocabulary practice. 
and our new test and train offers both exam practice and a timed practice test. And finally, if you've enjoyed this webinar, do check back and register for the others that we have in the series. Greg himself, as he's already mentioned, will be speaking live again on the 21st of April with a webinar on tips for um, B2 first. So if we could maybe pop that URL in the chat now um, for anyone who wants to take a look at um, future webinars, um, you can pick that one up. Um, and hopefully you found that useful. Now we're going to turn our attention to some of your questions. Um, let's get the question and answer box going. And um, let's see. OK, Greg, I've got a question hey. here from Flavia. Um, and she's saying, in Argentina, hey. younger and younger teens are preparing C1. What tips do you have for engaging them? Because um, some activities can tend to be too teacher centred. Um, okay, right. Here's, here's, here's an idea that I've, I've used with uh, with the younger students who um, I'm just uh, let me. Okay, I'm, I, I want to keep to basically what what we've been discussing today. So I'm gonna I'm gonna think of, of uh, part one, part two, or part seven, and I, I always think it's even though they really moan about it, if you get them, <laughs> you know, when you sort of say, okay, everyone get up and they go, oh, God, I'm so lazy. Um, it's, uh, let, let me, let me just, um, let me show it to the, uh, let me show it to this guy. So this is basically um, from the, the, this is the activity we did here. Um, do you know what? I could actually, I could actually launch it again. What am I thinking? Let's go back to. Uh, 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 I put you on spotlight, Greg. If you wanted to show the book, so you're, you're full screen. Um, okay, let's. So basically, this um, you know the text that we did um, just a moment ago um, about Everest. This urge to climb Everest. Um, that there is what they get they got it in the book um you have eight potentially potentially nine um questions that you could uh, my, uh, there's a lot of likes coming in but basically you get you they have got the text they've got the original text um and you on a separate sheet um on a piece of a4 paper you print out all of the answers and you chop them up and you, depending on, you know, how much room you've got, where, where I was working before, I had the classroom and there was the corridors outside and, and some space to, to work with there. So I would get the eight answers and chop them up and just stick them at various places around the, around the classroom and um, outside on in the corridor. And it's basically a, a, a fetching activity. They have to go and they have to look at all the answers and bring them back in the right order. I also find it's really nice to throw in a few wrong answers. So if you've got, say, um, the eight correct answers, add to that another sort of three or four words that don't fit in the text. Um, and it's all it is, is, is the principle is the same of getting the right answer, it's finding the right answer. But if, if you get them in, in little groups doing that, um, and they have, they, they have to come back and, and you know, give you them in the right order or it's, it's however you want to do it. But I, I just, I just think with these, yeah, it can be quite dry to do these, these exam tasks and everybody sits down and okay, let's, let's all do these together. Um, so again, it's, it's just thinking about, well, what have we actually got here that they're, they're working together to figure out what the answers are. Do go classic English language teaching, just, just put the answers up various places and get them running around the school and, and, uh, and annoying the hell out of the other teachers in the other classrooms. Are, who are trying to concentrate on what they're doing. Um, there is, there's, there's something that I'm going to be talking about in, um, in the first um, webinar that I'm doing in a couple of weeks that, that will also be, it follows similar lines. So there, there are, there are things you can do, but yeah, I, I do, I do, um, I do understand your, your um, issues there um, in terms of actually getting, getting younger students to uh, to to get stuck in um yeah but yeah try that it's good um okay um have you spotted any other questions Greg? there's an interesting one here it's, someone has said um do you think one-to-one -one classes can be as effective as group or pair um 
Cambridge English Advanced Preparation? Um, yes, but it depends. I mean, it depends on the student. <laughs> if, if, it's a, if you've got a student who kind of really wants to do it, um, of, yeah, of course it can be. But that's that's the same in, in every situation. I don't I don't think it's it's an interest it's an interesting one one to think about. And I've 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 thought about this so often over the years in, in terms of well we we've got an exam. What is an exam class and how does it relate to kind of language teaching and you know the communicative aspect of of teaching traditional kind of English language teaching and, and now this kind of right I'm in an exam class tell me what I need to pass this exam um, in, a, in a way I think yeah the, the, the traditional model of every you know everybody actually working to, to kind of practice and use the language that you're, you're doing communicatively is is great but I don't see any reason why, why that can't work in, in with a one-to-one -one, um, teacher it depends on age it depends on kind of motivation um but it's like it's like any any kind of english language teaching whether it's business or general or exam classes you kind of and i i wouldn't think that there's any kind of one is better than another it depends on the teacher and the individual i know that's such a cop out <laughs> it's, i know i'm kind of going oh, i don't know try it but it really depends it really depends on on who you've got and who you are and that's what i'm sorry that <laughs> Sorry, it's I haven't got the answer. Is is the answer to that one? Well, I mean, that's as good a question. It always <laughs> does depend on the student or students in the class, doesn't it? You've got to sort of adapt your teaching to um, yeah to the ones that, um, whatever environment you're in. So yeah, it's all part of the profession. Um, exactly. There's there's a question here that actually came in earlier, um, which would be what would be an interactive activity? Because obviously you showed quite a few activities. Um, is there a useful interactive activity that you could do um, when they're studying online um, as opposed to sort of speaking and doing it in a class? I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, it's, it's all about how you approach things in, in, in the end, isn't it? I mean, what we've done there, what we did earlier on with that sort of, hmm, fit, the, the hmm gap activity. <clears throat> I, I just off the top of my head, I think that could work as as a, a kind of a, an online thing because you can you can you can flip it around and you can um, you could maybe have the, um, some but certain students will get the first paragraph, maybe have to record themselves reading that paragraph with the hums in. Um, and then emailing it to somebody else and emailing it to somebody else in the class. And, and essentially what you can do then is you don't have to do a lot. <clears throat> you can put them in, in, into the breakout rooms and, and they can, um, they can discuss it amongst themselves there. It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, the on, on, online teaching is, I think it's been an interesting year for, for everyone to, to learn about how it actually functionally works because there's a lot that, that you can't do online learning that you can do in a classroom, but there is there is a lot that you can do with the same with the same materials that, that you've you've been using before. Um, and I, I think mean, it's all gone, Jenny. So I was just gonna jump in there um, and say, you know, it does depend on what technology you're using yeah. as well. I mean, you can use breakout rooms, for example, to get people. Yeah. Um, doing pair work or smaller group work and then as a teacher as you might in class go around and, and listen in to each of those groups so mm. getting comfortable with technology obviously really helps as part of that because then you can recreate more of those classroom situations but again you know it's not it's not the same and we've got no. to think of ways of adapting haven't we so. yeah exactly and, and and that is the thing is you know who knows when it's going to happen but um i mean certainly from from the perspective here the, the the kids have gone back to school now and and what i think is a night a really nice thing to bear in mind for the future is that at at some point everywhere we are going to all be in the position where it's all back in the classroom and it, it's working in the classroom again. And the great thing about it and the great thing to just have is that thing at, at the end is that the kids are going to really, really enjoy that as well. The students, whether, whether they're kids, are, are, you know, or, or, or older, just actually being in, in a classroom in that, that normal learning environment 
even the most kind of reticent um, students that you've had in the past, and, and if, you've, if you've taught the kind of the age groups that, that many of you obviously have and that I, I was teaching well, you can get quite a lot of resistance. But, I, I, you know, it's going to be quite interesting because I think by the time that comes around again, even the students who would traditionally be quite tricky to handle in class, I think they might be so, so relieved that they're in that situation again that it's going to, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic about how, how eventually it's going to pan out. And I think we, you know, it's, there's a lot that we can do online, but we, we you know, we can bear, bear that in mind as well, that normality will resume and, and the, the students are going to really feel as grateful as the teachers, I think, for it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the sooner we can return to something, you know, if 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 students were supposed to learn all the time online, then mm. you know we would never have schools in the first place. So I think exactly. We've got, to, we've got to accept that fact as well, haven't we? Um, I think that's about all we've got time for, um, everyone. Unfortunately, um, we've answered as many questions as we could. Um, so just another reminder. Um, certificates will be emailed to you along with the webinar recording next week um we're really happy that you've been able to join us today um for this webinar i hope you found it useful i'm sure you have um from the comments in the chat it's been great to see all of your feedback um and what you've been getting out of it and greg thank you so much for coming and um giving us your tips on c1 advanced so we hope to see you in one of our upcoming webinars um exams catch up do uh, thanks everyone thanks for coming us. enjoy the rest of your days bye-bye bye-bye